Everybody, welcome to another episode of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. I'm actually here with a very good friend of mine, Patrick Larkin, who is in uh, the Massachusetts area, I think, by Boston, correct, Patrick? And you're yeah. in uh, the Burlington area. And I've actually had uh, the privilege uh, to know Patrick. What's really interesting about my relationship with Patrick is when I first started on social media, I was a brand new principal. Uh, I was very new to the field. And I was kind of coaxed to go onto social media. And what I had saw was there was a lot of teachers there, but there wasn't many principals. And Patrick, uh, and I think Eric Scheniger was another one, were one of the few people that I connected with at that time. And we've actually been very good friends ever since. And I think it was interesting at the time because Twitter almost seemed like a place where people would uh, kind of make fun of their principles because their principles weren't on social media. And it's like, uh, when we went on, it was like, no, we actually agree with a lot of stuff and we're trying our best to help teachers too. So um, it, it was really great connecting with Patrick and I've been watching him throughout his career. Uh, I actually know his kids, have connected uh, with them, watched them grow up through social media and to be able to connect. And, uh, and to be honest with you, uh, Patrick is an absolutely amazing leader. The stuff that he's doing in the school district is awesome. But I, I will say to you, he's a better human being. Uh, I, I've known him very well. He's considered, I consider one of my closest friends and uh, just an absolutely nice human being, a, a wonderful dad. And Patrick, I, I'm so excited that you could be here today. And we've been talking for a while and just having a great uh, catch up. But can you tell people a little bit about sure. you and who you are and some of the work that you do? Sure. Yeah. So uh, I'm currently an assistant superintendent in Burlington Public Schools, which is uh, 12 or so up miles outside of Boston. I live up on the North Shore towards the New Hampshire border, um, have six kids um, with my, my wife, Wendy, three of mine, three of hers from a second marriage. And um, no, it's, it's an interesting time to be in education. I'm former principal, like George said, which I, I love being a high school principal. And uh, yeah, we connected on Twitter because we wanted to see what teachers were saying about us behind our back. So <laughs> all the people on Twitter told us, uh, no, but it, it's, it's been great to get to know you. I can't believe how many years it's been, George. And uh, you have certainly um, helped me grow a lot as a leader as well. Um, so I really appreciate all the work you've done um, in all the, you know, obviously the personal connections. Um, I've enjoyed watching you become a father and to your two daughters, it's really been a joy to see them grow up. And um, I, I'm sure one of the bonuses of this crazy situation you're in is uh, you're getting to spend more time at home with them. So there's there's never any uh, problem with that, right? So again, appreciate you having me on. I'm looking forward to talk a little bit. Well, yeah, and I actually like I I've watched um, you know your your son Tim kind of grow up and stuff like that. And we went to a Red Sox game together and years ago, and that was a lot of fun. I've been watching them and. Uh, saw him it's weird to see that I think he was maybe a freshman in high school and now he's graduated from uh, college and then Mary Claire the last time we all went out uh, for dinner with you and Mary Claire and we actually I think we had like clam chowder <laughs> mean. Mean, yeah. yeah we went to like an awesome uh, kind of like seafood restaurant I, I, I just remember doing that and it's funny because <laughs> you, you joke that we went on to see what teachers were kind of same behind our backs, you know, when we were administrators. But the reality, I think we not only went on to learn from each other, but we also want to see like what great teachers are doing and see if we can connect and learn some of those ideas. And I think, um, you know, Twitter, I don't know if Twitter's changed. I think that you evolve as you kind of use it, but like as you use social networks, like how, how do you use them to like connect and learn and to like help your staff right now? I mean, I think uh, Twitter's can be overwhelming, but I think um, people are still missing out if they're, if they're not like, you know, it's, it's the same as it's been. It's just, it's a little harder to drill down and find what you're looking for, I think, mm -hmm. but um, it's still an isolating experience. And especially now in the pandemic, we're all going through something new, but we're all going through similar things. So to be able to connect with that network um, and, and find people talking about remote learning or staying connected with kids or, teacher mental health and well-being and student mental health and well-being. Um, they're all critical areas. And as we both know, there's tons of resources on there. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. So to show people how to kind of where to look and how to connect with people is still as valuable as ever. 
Yeah, and I think one of the things, and I'm sure you kind of evolved on this too. We were like, oh, yeah, like, hey, Twitter, Twitter is the place to be. But um, I know a lot of educators actually that maybe not were connected through social networks for the purpose of like professional learning have connected on places like TikTok. And I've seen like, it was like really incredible support, some incredible ideas, um, you know, through TikTok, which might be a little bit harder to navigate to find, you know, stuff versus using something like TweetDeck on Twitter. I actually, no, you have a TikTok because I've seen some of the dances that you do with your kids. Maybe I should, uh, if you're watching the video, you might see a couple of the dances of Patrick with his kids. Uh, <laughs> did you do? Did you do the? Did you do the Renegade? Was that one of the ones that you did? I know. I know. I saw you doing a couple of dances there on TikTok. Mary Claire is my choreographer, so whatever <laughs> she feels like, the bar is set low for what I can handle. So right. she tells me if it's within my range of reach or not. And, and we and we practice and uh yeah it's a lot of fun that was one of the fun things about during the pandemic is again learning a new thing from my yeah. daughter yeah. well it, and it, it's cool in the sense that i think a lot of adults actually during that time you know a lot of people sign up for tiktok and shared through that space but i think a lot of them learned it through their kids through their students and i i think about that too because they, they almost went to kids and saying like, hey, can you help me out with this? Can you actually show me how to do this? And, you know, not just even the technology, but even some of the dances that they're learning. And I think there's a real power in that when we show we value the wisdom that our kids bring, you know, to our world every day and, and kind of learn from that. And so I've actually been kind of watching, you know, I, I saw a couple of those dances. I think Wendy was in a couple of them with you too. And uh, it, it's been kind of cool to see. The, the other thing that you and I both do, and I really enjoyed uh, reading from you, is reading your blog. And I've been, you know, I, I know you don't blog all the time, but every time you do, I get an email uh, notification. I read it every single time. And I always appreciate your insights and the stuff that you do. And I remember in March, uh, I was... I, like the work that I do, I travel, I speak, and that and that all of a sudden just halted, right? And it was it was something I was a little bit nervous about, you know, as everyone's kind of going through changes and whatever work they're doing. And you wrote a post about gratitude, and one of the things that you said that I actually, to be honest, with you Patrick, I, I took issue with when I first read it, uh, and I I've talked about that often. You talked about. Um, finding gratitude um, in, in a way be, uh, in, in what this current situation has created for us. And I remember first reading, I'm like, seriously, this does not seem like you. And I remember kind of being thrown off about it. Then I actually went through it. And then I started thinking about, um, for example, that, as you said, you know, I was grateful that I was getting time at my home or with my kids that I hadn't had before. And when... I started to read that more and think about it and try to like list things I was grateful for because of that time. What I think a lot of people might have kind of first thought was that's a very selfish act, right? Like there's so many things going on in the world and you're thinking about like what's good for you during this time. But what it, I had found that going through that process for myself, I, I was actually put in a position where I felt I was better able to help people because I wasn't so worried about myself, but I started thinking, okay, what do I have that's good? And how does that actually give me energy to help others and to create, you know? And so you talk a lot about gratitude and I don't know if you remember that, even remember that post, but I've talked about it a ton because I, I, I think it was really powerful and it's a good practice, but like talk maybe about that post, something like, you know, why you see gratitude so important. I think I was a lot of like, I know you do like some of the stuff I write is selfishly, it's for myself, like you're mm -hmm. working through stuff. And, and this has been a grind for all of us going back to since March, it's been a roller coaster. And I know at that time, I was really struggling a little bit with the losses, like all the losses that I've had. And I'm like, I was trying to get myself out of this like kind of negative mindset where I'm like, just dwelling on you lost this, you lost this, you lost this, like the routines. And um, I'm like, I, I have to think of some of the positives, like what are some of the positive things that have happened? So I decided to have a gratitude practice to like try to make note of something that was a positive. Yes, all those losses are still there. I don't want, you can't, you have to acknowledge those. I, one of the books I read during the break was um, 
Permission to Feel by Mark Brackett out of Yale, and I highly recommend it because I think you have to acknowledge and your feelings are your feelings. You can't brush them aside. So, but even when you're feeling down and feeling that heavy sense of loss, there are times that you can like, what, what's something good that happened today? And like one of the little things I remember was, you know, we'd put my mother up on the dinner table on the iPad and we'd call her into meals. And I'm like, I'm connecting with my mother more during this pandemic than I did, um, you know, prior to that. And like, what's wrong with that? My mother's in her 70s and like, how much longer am I going to have my mother in my life? And I'm connecting with her more. So there's something to be grateful for. Everything else, yeah, there's a lot of things that aren't great. Um, so I think those are the things we have to continue to try to do um, to navigate this because it's it's still going to be a few more months before we can start to see, I think, brighter times ahead and get back to hopefully more of our normal routines. Yeah, and it's interesting that you said that because I – about the how you kind of go through that process of blogging I, I i don't necessarily try to like write on current topics and you know what the buzz thing is i i i try to write to kind of work out my own ideas to kind of get stuff out there to sometimes maybe write something that might seem overly optimistic because i'm struggling because i'm maybe having a hard time and and i felt that um there, there was a transition for me where I was writing to try to build an audience and to like get people to tweet it out and to share that, um, where I've really tried to focus more on writing for what I'm passionate about, what I'm interested in in the moment, and that it will help somebody. Now, of course, like I like people reading my blog. It's, you know, I don't think... I don't know if I would put it on an open space if, you know, I, I didn't hope that it would help other people, but like, even I write like an email. Um, I just wrote an email. I write, try to write one every Saturday and somebody connected with me and said, you know, I'm going through this exact same thing right now. I'm having a hard time. And your email brought attention to this. And it was like, it's just try to write you know, kind of from the heart. And I think that's something that I really appreciate um, a, a, about what you do and, and how you connect. And, you actually, when we were talking, you are, uh, we we're talking in this December and this whole school year, it, you've actually been back with, I don't know if all the kids, but I know you've been back face to face uh, in Burlington. And I know that was something that you worked with your community on uh, and to do that. So how, how has that been so far? And, and, you know, what are some of the positive, maybe what are some of the challenges? I mean, the number one positive I think is, again, getting in a routine that's not just um, heavily with us staying at home or not coming to work or kids coming to classroom. So um, we have about two thirds of our elementary kids are coming to school every day. Um, it's smaller class sizes, about six foot distance in the classrooms between students and the kids are masked and they're staying in one classroom rather than move like they used to and the day's a little bit shorter. Um, but for them to, like we've heard over and over from parents after what they went through last spring, it's like night and day, they're seeing their kids, you know, light up a little bit and coming out of it. It's just not healthy for people to be stuck at home for lengthy periods of time, especially kids. Again, we don't have the movement we'd like to have with these kids, like, you know, how it's energetic elementary classroom. So it can be a little sad to look at sometimes, but I think we know that we're giving them as much as we can give right now and the teachers are working harder than ever. Um, so the challenge is really on the remote side, um, the high school kids, the middle school kids, when they're not in school, there's some hybrid, there's some asynchronous. Um, we're, str we're struggling there. I really think um, we're worried about kids having the social interaction or the level of social interaction that they used to have before us as teachers, as educators, having those little one-on-one -on -one conversations that we would have with kids and building that relationship has been more of a struggle, especially when you're not in the same physical space. But I, I don't think it's anything unusual to what all the people out there are dealing with. Um, we're, we're tweaking it as we go. We're trying to make changes on the fly and we're doing the best we can under these circumstances. Yeah, and one of the credits to, you know, to the, the teaching profession, and I, I think, and I hope people are sharing this, is the surprise of how much kids actually miss school. 
right? Like they it was funny. I, I remember uh, talking to this one kid, they were probably like 16 or 17 years old. And they were talking about, you know, in March, uh, it was announced that, you know, we weren't gonna have school. And I was so happy. <laughs> and I, you know, I'm thinking about like how I could sleep in, do all these things. And then three days later, I'm like, this sucks. Like I, I really miss school. And I, I, I find that really interesting because I, I think a lot of kids are gonna have an appreciation for school. And I'm not saying they didn't have it before, but I don't know if they actually realized it, right? You, you, you leave and I, like I, I always look back at my school experience and I remember complaining during the time and you know, always wishing I could go back and relive some of the things I have. But I think you know, a lot of kids are really appreciative of having that. And, and I think that the solution that you created might not be the solution that works for a community, but the way that you came together with it, because I know we were talking before, you you worked with your parents, you worked with your staff, and 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 you mentioned you know how your staff are working harder than ever, and I know that's the the norm for teachers all over the way. What are some of the ways that you've been able to, you know, provide more support during this time when they are exhausted? Like I was talking to a teacher, Lori McIntosh, recently. And she said, and we were talking about, and I made the analogy listening to her is that that Friday teacher tired, she's having Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday now. Right. So like, what are some of the ways that you're trying to support teachers during this time? I mean, we're really not to trying to add on. We're trying to be thoughtful. I mean, in the contract, it talks about, you know, you can have so many meetings after school hours. We're really trying not to have any and to fit any yeah. of those meetings that we would have into the structure of what would be the, the day in the contract. Again, it's it's a balance we're trying to make sure there's um we spend some time with some mental health like sel support in our pd time mm -hmm. really trying to make sure that teachers are taking care of themselves um it's hard because we're we're narrow with um we, we created this remote academy for about 400 elementary students so they're full-time remote because that's what the families wanted and um to really keep those teachers connected is a struggle but also um, to have them feel like they're part of our district because they're all remote right now yeah. is, is a challenge. So trying to write to them to stay connected, and reach out to them. But also uh, we're, we're so sh shallow staffing in our buildings, like um, people in the buildings don't have the same support they would because of, um, you know, our staff is so spread out. So just trying to have conversations with them, George, honestly, and what do they need? We have PD days coming up. We're not going to heavily schedule like, six hours of PD like you might have in the past. Like here, we have one thing we want to do on this PD day. What do you need? Give teachers collaboration time. Right. Um, we built in um, routine collaboration time on Wednesdays for teachers. Um, Cause that's a day where the afternoon there's no, um, most days there's some remote app in the afternoon, but on those days there's not, it's just time for teachers to connect and, um, and kind of catch up a little bit because it, it's a grind. So, I mean, I'm sure there's other things we could do, um, we're, we're looking to tweak things again as we come up on this break prior to the holidays. What can we do differently in January just to make this sustainable for people? Yeah, and like, like I've been thinking about that because a lot of the, you know, administrators I've talked to and had conversations with, they, you know, they talk about, um, and I, I think it's really important is that they talk about their kind of lessening initiatives, obviously, because we're like a lot of people like we want people to grow at all times but we also have to understand that we're trying to kind of survive and get through this space as well and i think it's really important that we kind of back off we don't spend a ton of time like hours and hours doing mental health initiatives when the best thing we could do for mental health is actually provide time just time on your own time to plan time to do whatever but uh, i think one of the hopes for me is that when we go back and you know kids are back all the time and who knows when that's going to happen and you know that could be a few months as you said it could be i don't know a few years i don't know uh that's that's not my thing to to plan but hopefully we understand that that's actually kind of important after a pandemic too and hopefully we've learned from this process that a lot of the stuff that we've been doing in the schools have been so overwhelming and exhausting that it's really hard to go in depth and i've seen schools like hey we're doing new initiatives 
every year and hey we haven't got good at that initiative yet but we're moving on to this one or moving on to this one pandemic or not that's not a good practice right we want to be able to give time uh you know to go into depth and i know that you've really spent a lot of time uh focusing on uh mental health and uh in in the connection between physical health personally uh, to be honest with you. And, and I actually remember seeing you, I think it was last year and, uh, you were, I was, you looked so good, buddy. I was <laughs> super impressed. You were so lean and, uh, you had worked out really hard. I see all these videos of you doing, uh, CrossFit and things like that. Cause like, if you do CrossFit, you got to tell everybody, right? So you post on Isn't that the whole thing with CrossFit? It's part of the rules. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. It's the opposite of fight club, right? Yeah. It's like if you are in CrossFit, make sure everyone knows you you take CrossFit, right? It's the opposite <laughs> of Fight Club. I'm just kidding, but it, it's like it's been helpful to you. And so, like during this time, you know, I think this is one of the things that's really. And I've been really trying to focus on my physical health, which I would actually say has been beneficial to my mental health. And I think they're two connected. So, like, what are some of the things that you do to take care of your own health during this time, mentally, physically, emotionally? I've been fortunate again. They uh, they adjusted the CrossFit schedule. They're doing it in a safe way, uh, socially distant, masked, right. and everything. But uh, 5 a.m. workouts every day, George. Uh, oh wow! Amazing way to start the day. Um, it's like therapy, and it's also uh, the coaches there are like uh, you know the owner, especially of the gym, um, watching his struggles as a business owner. Um, I think it's important, like the loyalty there, make, you know, there's a small group of us that um, can still go. So um, no, it, it starts with the physical and I leave, I've never left there feeling bad, you know, and um, mm -hmm. it's, it's like therapy for me. I probably need that too, but, um, but it's, and, and the nice thing about CrossFit and do, I mean, whatever you, you need to find something, I think to take yeah. care of your physical health, it doesn't have to be CrossFit, but the nice thing about CrossFit, if people haven't done it, is 100% scalable. It's not like what you see at the CrossFit games, like what we're doing, obviously. <laughs> it's like you start small. I don't know. I saw, I saw some of it. It looked like, it looked like the you CrossFit see, game. The you stuff you're doing. You all the time. Like you log your times. You log yeah. your stuff. You can see the progress, just like you're seeing yeah. progress in your health. I'm seeing progress yeah. in mine. And, um, but the sense of community is, is what also is a big part of it. So. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I encourage people to, to do something for themselves. And if you can do it with a group of people, I know we can't do it um, in the same physical space, but um, to find something for themselves to do. We need like it's, it's the gratitude, the same thing. Like what what's your daily routine? Like you need a, a routine that you can rely on now more than ever. So for me, it's it's CrossFit in the morning. It's taking some time for some mindfulness. I need to, one thing I need to pick up again is, is my writing because that's therapeutic for me as well. Mm -hmm. And um, just a small list of things that you try to repeat. And the one thing um, that, I, that I've really gotten better at as I've gotten older is I don't beat myself up anymore. Like if I miss, if I miss a day, if I have a bad day at the gym, I don't, I don't really care. Like I'm yeah. just going to go back the next day and try to do a better job with it. So, well, th that, so the thing with, you know, and I don't want to, I, I, I like CrossFit or I think it's good. I don't want anyone, I don't want CrossFit people, fit people get mad at me. So I know <laughs> I, don't, I don't want, I don't want to get bad comments on the YouTube video, but uh, the, I, I think you kind of said something that made me think about it. Like I used to teach um, spin for years and years and years. And I used to do it at six in the morning. And I always felt that exercising first thing in the morning made the rest of my day so much better. And I could, I could tell the difference. And uh, especially like when I was traveling and speaking, uh, sometimes I would get in, leave from uh, the West coast, get in at a, a late time on the East coast, have minimal sleep and say, okay, I'm going to try to do my workout later. And I always felt that I wasn't as sharp. I wasn't as, as good for the rest of the day when I didn't have like just a little bit of time to get a sweat in the morning and, and kind of connecting with that. And I felt that it, it, it also really affected my mental health and my emotional, like I, I, I would seem to be a little bit more edgy and, and struggle with that. And so I think, you know, for anyone listening, and, I, and I'm not saying like, hey, everyone should work out in the morning, you know, obviously, you got to figure out what works best for you. 
But I think that time to yourself, I, I look at it as um, we make appointments to do things, you know, with other people, you have to kind of make that appointment with yourself in some way, because I think it really kind of helps, you know, as, as you grow. And when you, you've talked a lot about, um, you know, your own blog and stuff like that, what is, you, you mentioned that it, it, it's been good for your, your own mental health. And I've been like a big advocate of people writing and sharing their learning. What have you found? Like, did that help you grow as a leader or an educator in any way when you went through that or, did you find it was just more helpful to others? Oh, I mean, again, I said at the beginning, and I'm not trying to be selfish about it, but you write for yourself to like work through things. So mm -hmm. from that reason, I think it helps you. And then as you know, um, been fortunate enough because you have a following or people read your stuff, it opens up conversations, which helps you again, evolve and learn even more or think more deeply about whatever the topic might be. So, um, you know, at the very least, like even, even just writing in a notebook is a great thing to go back and learn from. But when you have the chance to put it on the, um, you know, on a blog, I've learned over time, like my thoughts aren't very original. So if I'm going through mm -hmm. something, somebody else is probably going through something similar. So if it's helpful to them or they respond and tell me something they did that might be similar or different, it's just going to help me grow and learn. So um, I feel really fortunate to have been timing wise an educator when we were around it to, to, to use social media like that. Yeah. And I, I've been, I've been talking about um, this lately in a couple of podcasts and having a couple of conversations with people is we have been huge advocates of the importance of student voice, right? Students connecting and sharing the learning with the world, uh, you know, getting their ideas out there to do this. And I, I, I think, I think about how in education, we tend to go to like opposite ends of the pendulum. And I shared this the other day is that, you know, the, the thought of me using my voice in my classroom advocating for me as a kid uh, of what I needed, I don't think that would have lasted. <laughs> I don't think that would have been okay. To be honest with you, like, I it's like, you just shut up, like you do what we tell you. And then we went to this other side where we were trying to get more student voice. And I think that one of the things I'm trying to get better at is spending more time. Uh, and I've always done this, but I think just spending more time, like reading other people's stuff, uh, you know, reading posts, trying to understand different viewpoints. And I think we focus so much on student voice and, but what happens when we get everyone talking but we aren't listening, right? And it's kind of thinking about both of those elements are really important. Now, I'll share like a little, I, I know this is like a little pet peeve I have. Um, I'll post a blog uh, on something, I'll go onto Twitter and I'll have an image. And people like start blasting it on Twitter and saying, whoa, that's image, blah, 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 is stupid. I'm like, if you just read the post, you'd actually see that I actually don't agree with it, but it just by default post this. And too often, you know, it's, it's discouraging because I'll say, did you read it? Like, did you read that post, what I shared? And so I don't know, like, is, is there a connection there? Like, is there something that we should be focusing on kids? Because like you and I both believe that kids sharing their voice is extremely important. But if everybody's talking, who's listening, right? And that, what's the connection there? No, I mean, I think there's the, out, you know, output, output, output versus mm -hmm. what are you taking in? What's help, you know, what's helping you kind of reflect and think um and it can't be a, if it's one way it's you're not fully developing i don't think so i think the answer is i mean you used to do this a lot i think when um i remember back in the day you setting up helping people set up classroom blogs for their kids i think a lot of the process is reinforcing the importance of um going in and reading and commenting on mm -hmm. other people's things like i think that's part of that's kind of part of your responsibility if you're just there to put out your own things and you never really read anybody else's yep. I mean, that's kind of a that's not the type of perspective I think that we're trying to um, impart upon our kids like if they're really going to be well-rounded and taken you know especially nowadays more than ever George taken both sides of a conversation mm -hmm. um, not only it's not just important to read it's important to read diverse perspectives so there's like even a deeper step to that right and, and like, I, I've really tried to have it where, uh, 
like the only time I would comment on people's blogs is when I disagreed with them, right? And I felt ah, this is like, I've never interacted with this person, never had conversation. And then I just come out of nowhere. So I argue, whereas a lot of times when I agreed with something they said, I was just like, oh, that's great. And then just kind of move on, not acknowledge anything. And so I think a lot of times we were, we were talking about this recently too, is that some people, and I don't know if this was true for you when you first started on social media, um, we talk about like, Hey, we need pushback on social media. You know, it's really good to get challenged and things like this. And I'm thinking the reason I went to social media is because I was getting that all the time with some of the ideas I had in my school from like people I worked with, right. From people I shared, I need to know that what I was sharing was not, you know, totally, um, you know, off, you know, I wanted to see are other people doing this. And I think that's one of the things I connected with you, um, years ago was that I, I felt like, hey, I'm not the only one who thinks this way and other people are doing this. And now I can point to say like, hey, this school is doing this thing we're trying to do here and here's what they're showing as evidence. And I, you know, I think part of it too is trying to find people that are kind of going in the same direction, but also being cognizant that you don't create a bubble where you're not challenged or think differently as well. And you know, I, I think, like I said, a lot of people, are within their own schools get challenged and feel defeated. I've had lots of private conversations with people who like have gone to these spaces because they're kind of pushed aside in their own school. No, I agree with that. Um, you know, education hasn't evolved much as we know um, over the last century or two. Mm -hmm. And um, to be able to find people that are pushing and in a lot of cases, pushing for major changes and they're being successful, um, it's helpful to have those models, like the best practices for us to share as school leaders to say, I'm not crazy. They did this here. Like, here's the example. They've been doing it. Not only are they doing it, they've been doing it for five years already. Like, we're not ahead, we're behind. Mm -hmm. Like, just to kind of push those narratives a little bit, it's really helpful um, to find those people because no matter what it is, um, there's probably somebody out there doing it and doing it pretty well, whatever we're trying to do. I remember I was actually at this, um, I was at this conference and just kind of getting into social media and it wasn't like social media. It was the ideas of like what education could be. Right. And you're seeing all these different narratives, like really about, it, you know, empowerment and, and what that looks like for kids. And I, I, you know, this is probably on like 32, 33 years old. So this is, you know, 12 years ago. And I remember talking and there was a gentleman probably in his sixties and he, he looked at me and said, I've been, we've been advocating for this forever. Right. And like, I thought like, like this is the new generation is right. going to totally change school and we're going to change it. Like we're the first to kind of think this way and really the idea that there's been people that have been talking about a lot of stuff that we've been talking about you know for years prior and then you know and i'm sure they had people that they learned from like i remember actually thinking about one of the professors i had in university who was doing all this crazy stuff and i'm like that was the weirdest professor and thinking like, Oh, that would be me now. That's like how I, I teach. Right. And like, it was just cause he was so different from at the time. And I think one of the things that I know you and I have advocated for and uh, connected with, I would say that if you looked at the last, um, if you look at from like 1900 to 2000, I don't know if school changed dramatically, but I would say in the last five to 10 years, I would actually say school is trained changed significantly. And I think it's because we have that connection to one another, like that gentleman who had those ideas that, you know, I thought were, were new, had them years prior, but where does he connect other than those one off conferences? I think it's, you know, a credit to um, so many teachers connecting and learning and then making things happen too. Right. Like, I, like, I don't know if, You've seen that because I know like in your time with uh, Burlington, I've seen significant change within your own schools. No, it's true. Um, it's interesting that, you know, the technology is changing. I know we used to talk about a few years ago, you know, teachers just thought technology was this new thing right. that was going to pass us by. Like 
because they'd seen so many other things come and go. But obviously, people are no longer of that mindset. Obviously, the technology is here to stay, and it's it's changing faster than ever. But to your point, it was it was funny. You know, we started with the one to one iPads how many years ago, mm -hmm. and people thought it was so innovative. I'm like, they've been doing one to one in Maine for ten right. years already. That's where I read. You know, so it is it is it is all perspective and. Um, and trying to make those connections, like you said. And I do agree, and I think you highlight that in some of the talks that you've given, I've seen like how much we're changing in schools mm -hmm. nowadays. And, um, you know, the big thing for us is just to, like that's the world our kids are going into. And um, we as educators are embracing it more, I think in a lot of cases and, and trying to model that, um, that, you know, it's not gonna be some perfect final product that we're gonna be able to, um, to, to accomplish, but we're willing to um, kind of innovate along the way, or um, what's the word I hear that somebody use? Iterative. It's an iterative process. Right. So I mean, it, it's true, and and we just need to talk about like not be afraid to fail, like and because our failure is going to be. And again, I'm speaking to the choir because you say this all the time <laughs> in some of your talks. But we're going to lot more, learn a lot more by falling on our face than if we just yep. stay in the same mundane. Um, kind of tactics that we're using now so yeah like you, even even the sense of you know kind of going out there and kind of going through that process um i i would say and i'm sure you remember this to some extent uh because the whole notion of preaching to the choir i think a lot of times when we preach the choir it emboldens us to say things a lot louder louder and maybe even more pushy which yeah maybe gets the choir louder, but doesn't actually get anyone to join. And I think that the approach that I used to have would be like, oh, like if you're not doing this, like you're gonna be irrelevant and you know, like who'd want you kind of, and then now saying like that, that got the people that agreed with me, you know, to agree with me harder. It didn't actually change practice. And I, I tried to like do my best to like bring people with me as opposed to like, push sides. And I think it's, I think it's not just an education. That's true. I think in so many other fields is like, um, the, the message, uh, the message matters, but how you communicate the message matters as well. How you bring people along with you during that journey is, is, is really important. I know that. And I think that's, but I don't know if I would have ever realized that if I didn't first go out and try it in a way and say like, Hey, maybe this isn't working. Maybe like, I'm I'm being too dismissive of people that, you know, want to grow and want to change. And you've seen in the last, you know, several months that people we thought would never change are changing quickly. And maybe, and I always ask the question, is it, you know, maybe we didn't do a great job of convincing them. Maybe it wasn't them, maybe it was us, right? And that's something uh, I think about quite a bit. Now, you and I have gone to uh, several sports games. I remember we went to a Red Sox game together and we yeah. were actually really cool we were first row uh on the first baseline i'll never forget that i actually remember the guy like wiping off the seat it was a pretty exciting day for me uh we went to a couple celtics game in so boston even more red sox hat. even more red sox hat oh yeah oh yeah i was i yeah I, I have a picture of that you and uh tim and i that day um in boston's got a pretty good um you know uh sport history in like is that every team Boston, your team? I grew up with it. Yeah. So a hundred percent, like I grew up in Boston sports. I was fortunate. Like my, my family had Patriots tickets when I was growing up. So yeah. people that are from Massachusetts will remember like walking down to, uh, I think it was called Schaefer stadium. There was a Schaefer beer at the time and there yeah. were aluminum benches we sat on. And, um, <laughs> I grew up, I went to John Havlicek's last game when I was a little kid, my uncle. No, had, seriously, that's pretty cool. I didn't know that. And um, been to some Red Sox games, a lot of Red Sox games over the years. I was just fortunate. Um, I had a relative that had some connections with ticket people and uh, he, my yeah. uncle, my uncle would always come through with tickets for me, um, my uncle. So uh, I was really, I was spoiled as a kid. And I, it was just something I always followed the Boston teams my dad did, so I did. That's just how it worked, and now my son is in the same pattern. So okay, so who, who, what, which team? Which is the team though for you? Like, what's your number one team? Like, what's the number one sport? It was it was always baseball when I was growing up. For me, 
and I think like the Red Sox and baseball in general has lost some, I think, attractive because the attraction because the games become a lot long and boring. But so um, right now, I think because my kids are really into basketball, it's been more about the Celtics. And it's hard not to, it's, it's hard. It's hard not to, to you know, that hurt, that hurts right now. Yeah. <laughs> that hurts. You, you dethroned the champions last year. That was yeah. Bar- barely. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, you know, the, um, the actually, so I, I'm a huge, like I was a huge Expos fan, right? Like mm-hmm. I love the Expos and Andre Dawson. Um, after, yeah, like Tim Raines, Andre Dawson, uh, I, I can't remember the guy who wore uh, Tim Wallach. I think wore oh, yeah. like that. He wore like a, a batting helmet yeah. in the field. I don't know if you remember that. Um, but then when they folded the team and moved to Washington, I kind of fell out of love with baseball. And the the thing that got me interested again was when uh, the Red Sox came back and beat the Yankees, right? Okay. And there's actually like a great what is it like four days in uh, four days in October. Yep. Yep. Or something like that, or it could have actually it could have been forties. And it was like October, November. Exactly. Yeah, it was October. Yeah, but um, like, who, who's who's the favorite baseball player? Like for me, like Big Pop is like probably my favorite. Yeah, David, ever. David Ortiz, um, obviously, definitely. Like when I was a kid, it was like Carlton Fisk. I would say because I was a catcher when I played baseball. Yeah. Um, Kyle Skramski, obviously. You know, my brother and I played hours of wiffle ball in our backyard. Uh, you know, em- emulate people are talking about all the stances you would do, like uh, the Joe Morgan stance and yeah. Kyle Yuskinski stance and all that stuff. So, I mean, there's so many. We're spoiled in Boston. Um, my son, I remember when they won their first World Series, he was probably like four and waking him up out of his sleep, like, you're never going to see this. And uh, now they've, now they've won two in the... Patriots have won how many Super right. Bowls since he's been alive? These kids are spoiled. So the actually, I think I wonder if this is true. Boston is probably the only city that's won baseball, hockey, basketball, and football in the two thousands. Yeah, yeah, because we beat right? the uh, we beat the um, Canucks, right? Uh, the, yeah, yeah. Who was it? They, yeah, they, they yeah. Uh, for sure it's they beat right. Vancouver. Others, yeah. Yeah, that- and then you got the Celtics with Kevin Garnett, one in yeah. what, 2000? You got the Patriots. Uh, yeah. Patriots, I'm, I'm going to ask you, about, do you follow Patriots right now? Of course. I, Are follow, they- I, I, they, I followed bad teams when I was younger. I'm not jumping off the bandwagon. Who, who's, the, who's the bigger reason for the success of the Patriots, oh, Bill Belichick or Tom Brady? It's like, <laughs> that's like an impossible question. Like, well, that's, I, that's what we do in the podcast. We ask right. impossible questions and, um, and demand answers. Well, I mean, I, I just think Belichick is, uh, is an amazing coach. So I, I'm yeah. going to go with, I'm going to go with Belichick, but I mean, it's hard not, it's hard to disentangle those two, you know? Yeah. I think it, did you, I think you bought me a shirt that said, do your job. Did you buy did? me that shirt? Yeah. Like that was a Patriots thing. So, um, I wish yeah. he was a little warmer and fuzzier. I wish he would share more of like his leadership style and stuff like that. Like, I think he's an amazing yeah. guy, but just his, his press conferences are painful to watch. Well, I, I think it's intentional. It's definitely, it's <laughs> comical. A, you have to laugh. Like, intentionally painful. Well, hey. It, you do a, a, do a podcast like that. I'll, I'll just grunt and you, you just talk. <laughs> Yeah, that's a shit. That's a good idea, right? The the Belichick podcast. No, it's it. This is uh, for me one of the things that I always loved, um, and still do love about social media is, hey, this is great to talk about education, but I also think it's really important that we connect on a human level, right? And you know, I think one of the reasons that you and I have connected for so long is because we have so many interests um, and passions in education, but outside that actually connect and. Uh, I think are really powerful. It's one of the reasons I love, you know, kind of watching your kids grow up and watching them play basketball, uh, seeing that, you know, uh, Kalia is already into basketball. I have a video of her dunking uh, on a little net every year and, and raising it and see how, how she grows. So it's, it's kind of cool uh, to There's watch. No but we'll be, what's watching, that? we'll be watching her on our high school team soon, George. Yeah. So don't we'll play. See. Yeah, I know it's, it's it's going pretty quick so it's been um it's been interesting she she actually like she 
she knows her sports pretty well. She's a huge Raptors fan, nice. uh, which has kind of pushed me away from the Lakers a little bit. You know, Lakers Celtics big rivalry, yeah. but since we only got one team in Canada, right? And they're not even in Canada; they're in Tampa Bay right now. So, uh, yeah. I just Patrick, I I really appreciate your friendship. I appreciate uh, all you do for education. I know that. Um, I, I also know that you're, you, you, do, you do a great job supporting your teachers and, and the teachers in your district. Uh, I actually have connected with several of them. They're very complimentary of you. And I know that they uh, do a lot of great work and you, you do everything you can to support them. So I know that they appreciate that as well. So Lord, I, don't, we don't, I know you talked a lot about your parents over the years, but I was raised like for a lot of my life by a single mom who was an elementary teacher and Teachers are truly my heroes. I know as a leader, I don't always, um, you know, I'm not as successful as I would like to be in supporting teachers, but um, there's nobody that I would rather be connected to than educators if I had to pick one group of people in this country. So um, just to be honest with you. Yeah, well, I appreciate that, man. And so thanks for, thanks for your time today. Thanks for the conversation uh, during the podcast and uh, before the podcast too. We'll have to do that uh, recorded one day, but uh, I really appreciate you, my friend. And right. uh, thanks to everyone for listening. I hope you have a wonderful day.